after the Kouachi brothers stormed into the Charlie Hebdo offices and killed some of the staffers there. Journalists from all over the world scrambled to get any information they could about the attackers, and it led them to Yemen. Jeremy Scahill of The Intercept was the first to say Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula claimed responsibility for the attack. And his source was an anonymous member of Al-Qaeda. Other news organizations then did the same, and they also used unnamed Al-Qaeda sources in their reporting. And the FBI was livid. Director James Comey called it disgusting. I'll talk to Scahill in a moment, but first I want to go to Yemen and CNN's senior international correspondent Nick Payton Walsh. He's in Sana'a. And Nick, I, I suspect you may have to deal with this on a daily basis while you're there. Where do you come down on this issue of getting information from terror groups, even anonymously? Well, our job is to get as much information together as we can and assess what's reliable, what's true, and then present it in a comprehensible fashion to the viewer or reader. And doesn't really come into it quite uh, what level of attribution we would give to anybody in question. I mean, the FBI themselves regularly rely on anonymizing their officials to plant various bits of information too. Of course, there's a whole larger moral decision to be made when it comes to terror groups, uh, as many call Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. But in instances like this, we had already heard the two attackers, according to witnesses, say they had been sent there by Al-Qaeda in Yemen. So naturally, you would reach out to Al-Qaeda in Yemen and ask them if they're aware of any particular link. Now, of course, it's complicated because an anonymous source may choose to mislead you. And that's, of course, mm. why many organizations wait for the more public statements like we heard from Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula uh, a few days later in that lengthy 12-minute video one of their main spokespeople gave. But, but really, I'm kind of su somewhat surprised, frankly, because the job of journalists is not to uh, necessarily publicize their sources or um, pick and choose quite who we, we choose to, to convey to the viewer. Our job is something like that, to find out what motivation people had, what people are saying uh, they claim to have done, and then just pass it on to the viewer. And if it so happens that a source wishes to be anonymous, that may be a compromise we just simply have to go along with. Brian? Mm. Nick, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Nick Payton Walsh in Sanaa for us. And Jeremy Scahill is here on set with me. Let me bring him in as well because, Jeremy, I have a feeling this is one of the most uncomfortable issues for, for a journalist like you. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine trying to pick up the phone or send a text or an email to a terrorist to get comment. Well, I mean, first of all, in a time of war, good journalists have a responsibility to go to the other side uh, and interview the people that we're told we're at war with. Uh, in the case of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, this group has been identified by the U.S. government as the single greatest external threat facing the United States. Uh, why wouldn't we want to have an understanding of their thinking? Um, the anonymous issue, uh, I first of all am generally against using anonymous sources, particularly when they're senior U.S. officials. We saw what happened in the lead up to the Iraq war when Dick Cheney and others were leaking information to the New York Times and other papers that ultimately benefited the administration. In this case, uh, we had a situation where the gunmen uh, had declared that they were from al-Qaeda in Yemen. Um, I've spent a lot of time on the ground in Yemen. I have sources from a variety uh, of factions and groups in that country. Um, I decided uh, through a process that involved our editor-in-chief and our legal counsel to grant anonymity to a verified source for, within al-Qaeda mm. because it was of news value and if we had revealed the source their life could have been in danger. And, and that's where it gets complicated because that, that to me is one of the highest standards for granting anonymity is if the life of a source could be in danger. How does the communication work? I really can't tell you, but let, let's, just, let's just say that um, AQAP and other terrorist groups have developed very sophisticated ways to communicate using encrypted technologies. In mm -hmm. fact, they're ever-changing. Uh, there was an, uh, a, an app that they were using some time ago uh, that it turns out the NSA was involved with, with creating. Uh, and then really? and, and, it caused, and it caused a big shakeup in the sort of jihadist community online because huh. the, this app that had been developed, it looked like it was actually a Trojan horse developed by U.S. intelligence. N they actually, if you go and you look at Inspire magazine, which I assume you're not a subscriber to, this is the yeah. uh, Al-Qaeda English language glossy, yeah. uh, they have all sorts of encryption keys for people who want to write them a letter to the editor or are interested in joining Al-Qaeda. So you can actually send them an encrypted message. It's always disturbing to hear about how sophisticated these 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 people have become about how to communicate. Well, they also, you know, uh, of course, you know, you have a verified Twitter account, I have a verified Twitter account, that means we have a blue check mark next to our name. Al-Qaeda has its own way of verifying their Twitter accounts. It's mm. sort of like an alternative to the blue check mark. They, they mm. will list the accounts that are not shut down yet by Twitter and that they claim speak for them as a group and they'll publish it through their official channels. Mm. They're getting much more sophisticated using Twitter, Instagram, other online wow. platforms way more in the last year than they did prior to that. Jeremy, you've been highly critical of some television news coverage of uh, the war on terror for many years. I wonder if you think that the coverage currently of the terror attacks in Europe and this investigation now underway is sowing too much fear in the audience and the people watching at home. Well, I, I would separate into two categories. On the one hand, 
uh, we as journalists have a, a responsibility to cover this huge story that has global implications. And I think many networks do a good job of that. I think CNN has some great reporters on the ground. We just heard Nick Payton Walsh. Mm -hmm. He's a fantastic reporter. Um, where I think it gets into really kind of fear generating territory is when you have these so-called terror analysts on the air, many of whom also work for risk consultancy firms that benefit from the idea of making us afraid. Um, I don't think that CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News do anywhere near a good enough job at revealing the co potential conflicts of interest of some of the on-air analysts who also work in the private sector and make money off of the idea that we should be very afraid. Well, you understand that is a pretty incendiary charge, that these people want us to be frightened uh, inappropriately for well, unnecessary reasons. I mean, look, the, uh, I've spent a lot of years investigating how the war contracting uh, industry works. Uh, you'll have these retired generals uh, come on CNN, MSNBC, Fox, and they'll talk about the, the danger of a terror group in a particular country, and they're on the board of a huge weapons manufacturer or a defense company that is going to benefit from an extension of that war, an expansion of that war. Uh, perhaps the biggest uh, violator of this uh, is General Barry McCaffrey, who has made a tremendous amount of money um, off of war contracting, and then he's brought onto these networks and treated as though he's well, just so an executive So he's brought observer. on, and so are you. So what happens in these green rooms? I mean, you must you must see these people, talk to these people he, here in cable news green rooms. Yeah, well, I mean, it's uh, I, I have a lot of people who, uh, when they see I'm in a green room, leave, uh, because I, I also try to interview these people in green rooms because they never return my calls. So if, if you had a retired general sitting in the green room with me today, Brian, I probably would have turned on my iPhone recorder and started asking them questions. I, 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 right now, I wish I had booked one. But let me change <laughs> topics real quick because I want to turn back to Charlie Hebdo. In this, this moment from the Paris Unity Rally this time last week that we were covering live here on CNN, this was really a historic image. We're looking at over 40 world leaders marching arm in arm, united in their support of a free press and freedom of expression. But you called it a circus of hypocrisy. Yeah. Uh, and I want to take a look at a couple of the countries with a pretty terrible record yes. when it comes to press freedom. We made some graphics about this, beginning with Saudi Arabia here, relentless in its censorship of the media and internet. Saudi Arabia jails writers for insulting Islam. And let me go up to Egypt now. We're looking at the faces in the crowd here. Uh, actually, this is Russia. Russian media is under effective state control. It detains dissenting journalists and bloggers. And we can go on to another one as well. Um, this is the prime minister of Turkey who was at the rally. Turkey has imprisoned more journalists than any other country in 2012 and 2013. By the way, all this data is from Reporters Without Borders. And here is uh, Israel. Media in Israeli territory must comply with military censorship and gag orders. The New York Times experienced this last year, for example. So as we go through these, Jeremy, and here's Egypt, the last one. Uh, tell me um, if you feel like now, a week later, after this rally, um, if anything's actually going to change when it comes to press freedom in these countries. Well, no, I mean, and, and let's remember that Egypt, uh, you know, which is a close ally of the United States, is currently holding multiple Al Jazeera journalists who've been in prison for That's more right. than a year on totally ridiculous trumped up charges that they somehow are involved with promoting uh, terrorism. The United States, you know, of course, got a lot of flack because President Obama didn't go and, and you know, Joe Biden didn't go. Uh, but the U.S. also has a very poor record on press freedom. And this under this administration, the war against whistleblowers is, in effect, a war against independent journalism. Because what the, the message the White House is sending, and I'm glad that the James Risen case seems to be going away now, but, right. but it should have gone away a long time ago. When you say that we don't have a right to talk to unauthorized sources in government, what you're effectively saying is that you're only allowed to print official leaks or official statements of the government. It undermines the, the very idea of a free press. So the U.S. is not absent in this, even if it was absent in the literal sense on the ground in Paris. I, I think to get into comparisons, though, to Russia and Egypt makes me nervous. No, well, we I'm are not, much I, well, more first, free here. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, we're much freer, and, and we hold ourselves up as a, a sort of beacon to the world. Um, there's no comparison with Russia, Turkey, and the United States. But that doesn't mean we, ha we don't have our own war on journalism. You know, and yes, there, there, there are different levels of it. But let's not pretend like the United States does not have a hostile posture at times toward journalists who are reporting inconvenient facts. Jeremy, thank you for being here. Thanks, Great Brian. talking to you. Thank you.